Welcome to my series of videos on Mathematics for Economists. In this video, I'm going to go through a number of examples for optimization under equality constraints. Uh, so we're going to apply the Lagrange multiplier theorem, work out the necessary conditions, uh, find candidate points that satisfy the necessary conditions, look at which one of them yields the highest value of the objective function, and then for the so found a candidate for the optimum, um, check the second order conditions. And then I'm going to look at a few examples where things go wrong and discuss constraint qualification in those examples. Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, first example here where we have an objective function that goes from R3 to R and returns for the input arguments x, y, and z, the product x times y times z such that the two constraints are satisfied x squared plus y squared is equal to 4, or in other words, the vector xy has length equal to 4, and x plus z is equal to 2. So the first thing we do is we write down our Lagrange auxiliary function, which is the objective function x times y times z, minus the first Lagrange multiplier, which comes with the first constraint, left-hand side of the constraint minus right-hand side of the constraint, minus the second multiplier, which comes with the second part or the second constraint, left-hand side of the constraint minus right-hand side of the constraint. And now we find the necessary conditions by setting all the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, z, and with respect to lambda 1 and to lambda 2 equal to 0. So we take the partial derivative with respect to x. This is yz minus 2 lambda 1x minus lambda 2 equal to 0. The partial derivative with respect to y. This is xz minus 2 lambda 1y equal to 0. The partial derivative with respect to z. This is xy minus lambda 2 equal to 0. The partial derivative with respect to lambda 1. This is x squared plus y squared minus 4 equal to 0. And the partial derivative with respect to lambda 2. This is x plus z minus 2 equal to 0. The partial derivatives with respect to the Lagrange multipliers are of course only repeating the constraints because those are the factors of the lambda coefficients in the Lagrange function, in the Lagrangian. And um, so now the, the general structure of the problem that is facing you at this point is that you have a system of nonlinear equations, usually nonlinear, um, that you have to solve, and it's a, it's a square system in the sense that you have as many equations as there are unknowns. So here, 5 for x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And uh, uh, because the system is nonlinear, methods of linear algebra are not going to help you here, uh, but you have to be, in a, to a, sen in a sense, uh, uh, lucky that you find the right angle of attack to solve this nonlinear system of equations analytically. Um, as long as there are no uh, linearly dependent equations in some sense uh, uh, multiples or, or multiples of one equation added to another, uh, there is going to be a solution or maybe even several solutions and you can find them um, usually by, uh, uh, you, can, you can find them definitely by numerical methods, but of course here we're interested in finding them analytically there so that you can um, understand the structure of the problem. So let's see what we can do here in this case with these five equations. And the basic idea is what you want to do is you have, you're dealing with five variables. You somehow want to reduce the number of variables that you have going on by isolating some of them and then plugging them in into other equations so that ideally you can somehow find one equation and one unknown which you then can solve, hopefully. Uh, so here we see from equation two that lambda one is equal to x times z over 2y, right? This happens if I, um, if I isolate lambda 1 in equation.
equation 2. In equation 3, if I isolate lambda 2, I get that it is x times y. So now I'm working towards this goal of substituting uh, in the sense that I express lambda 1 and lambda 2 as functions of x, y, and z, so that I can replace lambda 1 and lambda 2 in the equations by x, y, and z, so that I can express everything as a function of only three variables. Uh, so I go into equation 1, which right now reads yz minus 2 lambda 1 x minus lambda 2 equal to 0. And now I do exactly this. I replace lambda 1 and lambda 2. So I get yz minus, now I have in lambda 1, I have, a, I have a 2 in the denominator, so the 2 cancels out. I have an xz for lambda 1 in the numerator, so I get times x is x squared z divided by y. Minus, I replace lambda 2 by x, y equal to 0. So I have gone from an equation in x, y, and z to an equation in just x, x excuse me, from an equation in x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2 to an equation in just x, y, and z. All right, so let's multiply this by y. y squared z minus x squared z minus x y square is equal to zero. Okay, uh, I have gone from five unknowns to three unknowns. That's good, but uh, doesn't doesn't lead me all the way yet. So I'm uh, now using equation four because equation four tells me that y square is four minus x square, and then I can replace the y square here by four minus x square. And then I'm using equation 5, which tells me that z is 2 minus x. And then I get one equation and one unknown, which is x. y squared is 4 minus x squared times z is 2 minus x minus x squared times z is 2 minus x minus x times y squared is 4 minus x squared must be equal to zero to satisfy the necessary condition. Okay, so now, because this is a nonlinear system of equations, if you have done this and uh, uh, substituted until you arrived at one equation and one unknown, uh, this equation can and will usually be uh, a highly nonlinear object, and that's what we have in front of us here. You can see that the highest power of x that is going to occur in this polynomial, once I have cleaned it up, is going to be x cubed. So we don't have a, an algorithm ready at hand to solve for the roots of this third degree polynomial, uh, which is what we need to do because the first order conditions say that this equation needs to be equal to zero. However, you can see here that this example is designed such that if you look carefully at it, you can actually by eyeballing see what one root is going to be because if you look at the first two terms, they both have the factor 2 minus x. So if you set x equal to 2, the factor 2 minus x is certainly going to be 0. Uh, what about the third term, uh, x times 4 minus x squared? It does not have the factor 2 minus x. However, if you set x equal to 2, then 4 minus x squared certainly is also equal to 0. And so you can actually see that x equal to 2 is a root of this polynomial. So let's write down what this polynomial is. Uh, 4 times, I'm just factoring out these uh, three terms here, so 4 times 2 is 8, minus 4x, minus 2x squared, plus x cubed, minus 2x squared, plus x cubed, minus 4x, plus x cubed, equal to 0. Now I see that I have 3x cubed, I have minus 4x squared, I have minus 8x, and I have plus 8 equal to 0. What does it mean that x equal to 2 is a root of this third degree polynomial? This means that there is a second degree polynomial out there, which I don't know yet, such that if I multiply it by the linear factor x minus 2, 
which sets the whole thing equal to zero if x is equal to two, will give me my original third degree polynomial three x cubed minus four x squared minus eight x plus eight. How do I find the second degree polynomial? Well, by dividing the whole equation by x minus two. This is long division, which you may remember. You have to divide the leading term 3x cubed by the leading term in the divisor. This is x, so you get 3x squared. Then you multiply your way back 3x squared times x plus 3x squared times minus 2. you get 3x cubed, obviously, minus 6x squared. Then you subtract 3x cubed minus 3x cubed is 0, minus 4x squared minus minus 6x squared is plus 2x squared. And then you can pull down the other terms from above and you keep going. You divide the first term in the remainder polynomial by the first term in the divisor and you get plus 2x then you multiply your way back and you get 2x square obviously minus 4x then you subtract 2x square minus 2x square is 0 minus 8x minus minus 4x is minus 4x and the plus 8 we haven't done anything with Minus 4x plus 8 divided by x minus 2 obviously is minus 4 because if you now multiply your way back you get minus 4 times x minus 4 times minus 2 is plus 8 and if you now subtract you get the remainder 0. So we have found the second degree polynomial which is standing right here. Okay. Now we're supposed to set the whole expression equal to zero and so we also need to find the two roots of this second degree polynomial and now you can apply your favorite formula for solving quadratic equations. Yeah. And uh, if you call this ABC formula or PQ formula or whatever, um, let's write this as, since we have to set 3x squared plus 2x minus 4 equal to zero, we might as well divide by 3. So we get 2 third x minus 4 third equal to 0. And we get the two roots minus 1 half times the, this coefficient here. Uh, so this is minus 2 six or minus 1 third uh, plus minus the square root of 1 quarter times the square of this coefficient, which is 4 ninth, uh, minus the third term, so this minus minus 4 thirds is plus 4 thirds. Yeah. And uh, 4 third, that's um, 12 ninth, plus 1 ninth is 13 ninth, and so I can write this as minus 1 third plus minus uh, the square root of 13 is some real number that I don't know by heart. Uh, the square root and the denominator of 9 is certainly 3. Okay, So we have uh, three linear factors. So we can write, we have now found out, we can write our polynomial of degree 3 as the product x minus 2, that was the first one, uh, x minus minus one third plus the square root of 13 divided by 3 times x minus minus one third minus the square root of 13 divided by 3. Uh, so now I can read the three roots of the polynomial from my decomposition into linear factors. Okay, um, so we have three candidate points for x that satisfy the necessary conditions. So let's find the corresponding 
Y's and Z's that go with this so that we have the full set of candidate points in X, Y, Z. So let's start with X equal to 2. That was the first one we saw. From equation which reads x squared plus y squared equal to 4. If x is equal to 2, x squared is equal to 4. So we get y squared must equal 0, and this means that y is going to be 0. Then from equation 5, which reads that x plus z must equal 2, if x is equal to 2, this means that z must equal 0. So our first candidate point for x, y, and z is 2, 0, 0. Then we have the second <coughs> root for, for x here. So this would be, let me write it as square root of 13 minus 1 divided by 3. Again, I use equation 4 to find out what y is going to be. Y is four minus uh, y square is four minus x square, right? And so y is plus minus the square root of four minus x square. So this is four minus square root thirteen minus one divided by three square. And then five gives me uh, that uh, z is two minus x. So this is two minus square root of thirteen minus 1 divided by 3. So this is my, uh, actually my set of the next two candidate points because I have a positive and a negative value for y here that are all going to satisfy the necessary conditions. So let's look at the last value for x here, the negative root of 13. Uh, so I have minus 1 minus 13, so let me write the minus in front of the fraction, and then I get square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3, and uh, then I get y equation 4, that y is plus minus the square root of 4, um, now minus, and then I have x here, x has a minus but it's going to be squared so the minus is going to be neutralized so I can write square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3 squared here and I get from 5 that z is 2 minus x and that's minus minus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3. Yeah. We have, again, two further candidate points because we have, again, a positive and a negative y here that's going to satisfy the first order condition. So we have a set of five candidate points that satisfy the first order conditions. So in order to find now which one maximizes our objective function, we just plug all five candidate points in and evaluate the objective function. So the objective function, remember, is x times y times z. So 2 times 0 times 0 is certainly 0. So the first one is easy. Then we have x equal to square root of 13 minus 1 divided by 3. The positive root 4 minus square root of 13 minus 1 divided by 3 squared. And 2 minus square root of 13 minus 1 divided by 3. If you plug this into your pocket calculator, you find that the value that you get here for the objective function is roughly equal to 1.77. So it's certainly higher than zero. We have to evaluate the negative root. But of course we can, since we now put a minus in front of y and x and z remain the same, and the objective function is x times y times z, all we're going to do is switch the sign. And since we want to maximize, this is actually not an interesting point. Now, we want to have the negative square root of 13 in x. That's the second uh, root of our quadratic remainder polynomial we found. So this is minus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3. And then uh, we start with the 
positive root for y, 4 uh, minus, and now x squared, again I, uh, I ignore the minus because it's going to be neutralized, and then I get 2 minus x is here plus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3, and if you put this into your computer, it will going to it will um, return a value of minus 6.96 roughly. Um, but now that's that's absolutely high, but of course we're maximizing, so minus is not good. Uh, but now we need to uh, also look at the negative root for y, and that of course is going to neutralize the negative sign of x, and then we are going to switch the sign on the value of the objective function, and that's our interesting point that gives us our maximum of roughly 6.96, which is certainly higher than 1.77. Yeah. So this is the point of the candidate set of five points that satisfy the necessary condition, which returns the highest value of the objective function. Let us verify that this is indeed a maximum by checking the second order conditions. Let me first repeat the Lagrangian and let me multiply out all the terms that come with the with the constraints and the Lagrange multipliers because I want to take second order derivatives and so it is uh, more convenient to uh, have this in longhand. Sorry, this is lemma two. Okay, uh, what happens in the in the second order conditions? Um, as in unconstrained optimization, here we have a we have a maximization problem. So as an unconstrained maximization, um, the Hessian matrix in the maximum must be negative definite. But because we're under equality constraints, the Hessian must be negative definite only in the admissible directions, which means only in those directions that satisfy the first order, that satisfy the, um, the constraints. We're only looking into the directions that satisfy the constraints. The directions here are the, uh, are the vectors uh, uh, x, y, and z. And um, in order to do this, we, we use this object of the bordered Hessian. Uh, which is essentially a mnemonic device that uh, uh, tells us, uh, 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 that gives us determinant uh, conditions for the Hessian matrix uh, to be um, here negative definite because we have a maximization problem uh, uh, subject to the, to the constraint that we're only looking into the directions that satisfy the constraints. Yeah? Uh, so we need to form the Hessian in any case, so we are going to have to calculate all the second-order derivatives. So let's start at that simple point. That we can certainly uh, do without any further ado. So the second derivative with respect to, partial derivative with respect to x is minus, excuse me, minus 2 times lambda 1. The second derivative with respect to y is also minus 2 times lambda 1. The second derivative with respect to z is equal to 0. And now the, the cross derivatives, the second order derivative uh, with respect to x and to y is z. And because the Lagrangian is twice continuously differentiable, this is also the second order derivative with respect to y and to x. Uh, second order with respect to x and to z is y, and this is also with respect to z and to x, 
and the second order derivative with respect to y and to z is uh, x, and this is also the second derivative with respect to z and to y. So uh, we have all the elements in the Hessian. Um, now the bordered Hessian has also the, the gradients of the constraint functions, and the reason they are in there are exactly to ensure that we only look in directions that satisfy the constraints. So this was x squared plus y squared is equal to 4, and this here is x plus z is equal to 2, so the uh, partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z are 1, 0, and 1. So we can form our, our bordered Hessian um, of, of third degree. So let me write uh, H bordered Hessian of three degree three. Uh, this means that de uh, uh, the, the, the degree here means that we, we have for the uh, x, y, and z dimension in the Hessian. So this is uh, it's not a power or anything. This is just... A, it's just a figure of speech. So what does it look like? 2y, 0, 1, 0, 1. And here we have the gradient of the first constraint. Here we have the gradient of the second constraint. And now in the remaining uh, the lower right 3 by 3 block matrix, we have the Hessian. Right? So we need to have all those objects that we calculated here. So the diagonal is minus 2 lambda 1, minus 2 lambda 1, and 0. Those are the second order derivatives. Excuse me, I have uh, that's better. Um, and now the cross derivatives x and y, that's z. Uh, x and z, that's y. And y and z, that's x. So this is my bordered Hessian where I have. Uh, where I have the Hessian for all three variables x, y, and z. And then I look also at the uh, at the fourth principal minor here, which means that I'm just looking at so this here are the three, and now I'm just looking at two. Uh, so I get 0, 0, 0, 0, 2x, 2y, 1, and 0, um, 2x, 2y, 1, and 0, minus 2 lambda 1, z, z, minus 2 lambda 1. And now, in the same fashion as in unconstrained maximization, where you check whether the Hessian is negative, definite by the Hurwitz criterion, where you look at the determinants of the leading principal minors, uh, we have a corresponding, uh, a corresponding determinant criterion for the bordered Hessians, which are uh, also in terms of the principal minors, but not all of them. Um, you have to look a bit more carefully. Uh, that's a theorem here. I'm just applying it. So what we need to have is that the determinant of HB3 be negative, and that the determinant of h b 2 be positive. And if you now, well, the, we have x, y, z, lambda 1 going on here. Uh, lambda 2 doesn't figure in the uh, border Hessian. Uh, so now we need to replace x, y, z, and lambda 1 by our candidate point that we have identified, uh, which is x, equal to minus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3. y was the negative square root of 4 um, minus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3 square. And z was 2 plus square root of 13 plus 1 divided by 3. Lambda 1 uh, was from the from equation 2 given by 
right, x, z divided by 2y. Yeah? So given x, y, and z, you can also calculate lambda 1. And if you now, if you now do this and uh, plug these numbers into these matrices and then calculate their determinants, you find that the determinant of HB3 is roughly equal to minus 130.71 and the determinant of HB second order is roughly equal to 6.57. So they do satisfy the second order conditions and we have indeed found a maximum subject to these equality constraints. Yeah? So this example is here finished and we have arrived at a solution at the maximum of x times y times z subject to the constraints that x squared plus y squared is equal to 4 and that x plus z is equal to 2. Good, that's the recipe and now I would like to discuss what can go wrong. Let's um, start a new, a new sheet here and let's consider a new example. Let's consider the maximization function with respect to three uh, variables x, y, and z. Oh, excuse me. Uh, no, let's uh, let's just have a, a function from R two to R. So we have just an f of x and y, and the objective function is just given by x. So it's a bit boring. Uh, it just returns the first coordinate. The constraint, we have just one, is that x cubed plus y squared be equal to zero. Okay, now we follow the recipe and see where that leads us. So we form our Lagrangian, uh, which is the objective function x minus, we only have one Lagrange multiplier, uh, left hand side of the constraint x cubed plus y squared minus right hand side, that's just minus zero, so I can ignore this. Uh, so I can find the first order conditions by taking the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x. This is 1 minus 3 lambda x square, and this must equal 0 to satisfy the first order condition. With respect to y, I get minus 2 lambda y equal to 0. And with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, I just repeat the constraint that x cubed plus y squared be 0. Good. Now I can try to follow the same road and try to uh, somehow substitute such that I end up with one equation and one unknown. Let me see if that, uh, if that is successful. So let's start at equation uh, 1 and solve it for lambda. So if I do this, I get that lambda is equal to uh, 1 over 3x squared. Hmm. Remember that the Lagrange multipliers must be, the way we have written the Lagrangian, must be positive or can be 0, uh, but they cannot be negative and they cannot be infinite because they must exist, and exist means they exist in R, and they don't explode. And this means that x must be finite here, yeah? because of, uh, uh, sorry, this means that x must be, uh, uh, must not be equal to zero, because if x was zero, then lambda uh, uh, would be infinite. So uh, uh, x equal to zero cannot be. Um, okay, so if we assume that, that x is not equal to zero, we can go into um, we can go into let us say equation two. So we have two times lambda times y is equal to zero because I can multiply this equation by uh, by minus one, right? So two times lambda this times y this is two y divided by three x square must equal zero. Okay. So now we have. Um, uh, uh, we have seen x cannot e cannot equal zero. Now, in order to to have y 
uh, to have this fraction equal to zero, y must equal zero, right? Okay, um, so now we go into equation three and then we see that we have a problem because if y is equal to zero, then we get the equation that x cubed must equal zero. And the only solution for x cubed uh, to equal zero is that x equals zero and we have seen that this cannot work with our uh, first equation. So we have a contradiction here, which I symbolize by this little uh, flash of lightning that hits us here. So um, uh, we have a contradiction and we cannot find a solution of our nonlinear system of equations. Why is this? Um, so uh, uh, there are two ways of explaining why this is. Uh, let's start with the analytical one. Uh, this is because constraint qualification is not satisfied. Uh, what is constraint qualification? Constraint qualification says that the um, gradients of the objective function in the optimum must be linearly independent. Here we only have one and uh, linearly independent here means that it must not be equal zero, must not be equal to zero, right? So what is the gradient of g? Uh, g was uh, x cubed plus y squared equal to zero, so the derivative with respect to x is, uh, is 3x cubed, 3x squared, and the derivative with respect to y is 2y. And now we see that in the point x equal to 0 and y equal to 0, which we have not yet established as a maximum, but it's clearly interesting from uh, looking at the first order conditions. In the point 0, 0, the gradient of the constraint is 0, so it is degenerate here. Now we can also look at the geometry of the situation. And if we look at the third condition, then we see that, which, which reads x cubed plus y squared equals zero. Uh, this means we can write y as plus or minus the square root of minus x cubed. And in order for this, the, 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 the number under the square root sign to be positive, x, of course, must have a negative value because then x cubed is negative, and so minus x cubed is positive. And so I'm only plotting in this picture here the negative, uh, negative half-space for x, and then I'm plotting the negative square root of minus x cubed. That's the... That's this orange curve here, and then the positive square root of minus x cubed, and that's the blue curve here. So this constraint must be satisfied, and this means that only points on these curves are admissible. The objective function uh, is only x. So if we were, if we are to maximize x, this means that we have to find the, the point on these curves that gives us the largest value on the x-axis. And so eyeballing the geometry here, we can see that the solution to the problem, the highest point, the highest value for x that lies on these curves is the point x equal to zero which then implies that y is also equal to zero. So as we have kind of seen in the first order conditions, zero, zero is the point we're looking after. However, because the, the constraint is such that the gradient of the constraint in the point zero, zero is equal to the zero vector, uh, we cannot find this point by solving the nonlinear system of equations solving the first order conditions. So this is one way how this can go wrong. Yeah. Let's have a look at a, another example how this can go wrong. And let's start uh, yet another sheet for this.
So if you look at the same objective function, which maps from R2 to R, but just returns the boring first coordinate. And now we have two constraints, which read x minus 1 square minus y plus 1 is equal to 0. And x minus 1 square plus y minus 1 is equal to 0. We follow the recipe again, form the Lagrangian, which is objective function, minus, now we have two Lagrange multipliers again, x minus 1 square minus y plus 1 left hand side of the constraint minus right hand side of the constraint which is just 0 here minus second Lagrange multiplier for the second constraint plus y minus 1 minus 0 and we go ahead and try and find the first order conditions by setting the partial derivatives with respect to x to y to lambda 1 and to lambda 2 equal to 0 this is 1 minus 2 lambda 1 x minus 1 squared minus y plus, no, sorry, that's not right. What am I doing here? Uh, so that's better. Um, minus 2 lambda 1 times x minus 1. That's the derivative with respect to x of the first term here, and now the derivative of the second term with respect to x. That's what that would be. Minus 2 lambda 2 times x minus 1. And we set this equal to 0. Okay. The derivative with respect to y is, uh, it just appears here and there. So minus minus is plus lambda 1, and minus plus is minus lambda 2 is equal to 0. And that's an interesting one, right? Because it tells us that lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. Uh, third is just repeating the first constraint. And the fourth is repeating the second constraint. Okay, so let's start with this interesting one here. Lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. Aha. So this means that in the, let's call it lambda. This means that in the first one, which is now 1 minus 2 lambda times x minus 1, minus 2 lambda times x minus 1, so this is minus 4 lambda times x minus 1, equal to 0. This means I can solve for lambda, which is 1 over 4 times x minus 1. And again, from the discussion we had before, this thing must not explode. So we see that uh, x cannot be equal to 1. Okay. What do we get from equation 3? We get that y is equal to um, 1 plus x minus 1 squared. And from equation 4, we get that y is equal to uh, 1 minus x minus 1 squared. So these two expressions must be the same. So 1 plus x minus 1 squared is 1 minus x minus 1 squared. I can subtract 1 on both sides, and I can bring uh, the, the negative 1 over to the other side. And so I get that 2 times x minus 1 squared must equal 0. That's unfortunate, because the solution uh, uh, to this would be that... Um, that x is, or one of the solutions to this, is that uh, uh, that x must uh, must equal 1, and this is a 
violation of lambda being uh, being finite. Mm -hmm. um, this is the only solution to, for for x minus one square being equal to zero. I can of course divide by two. So uh, we have again a, a contradiction. So we cannot solve the the nonlinear system of equations, and we can again. Um, kind of go into the forensics and try to explain why this is the case. So let's look at our uh, constraint qualification condition again. What is the uh, do you, what are the partial derivatives of the first condition? Uh, so with respect to x this is 2 times x minus 1 and with respect to y this is minus 1. And the second one Uh, partial derivative with respect to x is again 2 times x minus 1 and with respect to y is plus 1. And now we see that in the point x equal to 1 this is exactly where we are in trouble because we have the problem that the first the gradient of the first uh, constraint is 0 and minus 1 and the gradient of the second constraint is 0 and 1. And these are linearly dependent, obviously, because 1 is just minus 1 times the other. Yeah. So we can again look at the geometry of the situation. So if we look at, well, essentially, look at these two expressions for y that we have here and we plot these two functions of x then we have a parabola that opens to the bottom that's the orange one here and we have a parabola that opens to the top that's the blue one here and both are equality constraints that must hold which means that we're looking at uh, at points that lie on the intersection of these two curves. And the intersection of these two curves is a single point, which is x equal to 1, and then, therefore, y equal to 1. So, again, we have seen in the in our attempt at solving the necessary conditions that x equal to 1 is very interesting, but uh, uh, we had a failure of constraint qualification there and so uh, geometrically here we see that the problem is that our set of admissible points that satisfies both constraints that set consists actually of just one point the one point one and one so this means that the maximization uh, find the largest x such that these two constraints are satisfied has no bite because there's only one point. So if you have to satisfy the constraints, there's only one x, and therefore, by definition, it's also the largest one. And so um, uh, there is no way to further uh, 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 to find different points that will yield a higher x. And so one and one is, in fact, the solution to our problem, but it is uh, uh, only one point, and the constraint qualification condition does not hold at this point. So that's that's what's going on. Yeah. So we've seen two examples here where the the recipe that we followed in the first example uh, in order to find the the maximization the, maxi the maximum point for um, uh, for a function subject to equality constraints where this goes wrong because constraint qualification is not satisfied and appreciate that geometrically these are two quite quite different situations right in one case we have this kind of cusp in the uh, uh, in the constraint curves and in the other example we have um, uh, we have chosen the constraint such that the set of admissible points really is just one point and so therefore our maximization has has no bite and can only choose that one point uh, but in both cases we can actually diagnose the problem by looking at the gradients of the constraints and checking whether they are uh, linearly uh, independent or not. Yeah? 
So this is, uh, these are some examples on uh, optimization under equality constraints using the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Thanks a lot for watching.